Defensive backfield at cornerback. Mike Rodak covers uh, the Alabama for CBS Sports and 247. Joins us on 365 Sports. Mike, thank you very much. Alabama, to me, if there's somebody that can go into the game against UConn and just wing it, not that that's, that's not a negative, but they can fire the three, number two in the country, making threes. It seems like at least that's their chance. Am I right? Yeah, it's definitely going to have to be a higher scoring game. I mean, this isn't the Alabama team that's going to grind out a game and win with their defense and win with a big man, and slow it down. But that's, that's not really how they play. I mean, they've had good defenses in the past. I think that's somewhat of a misconception is that they don't play defense. They, they did it really well last year. They did it really well three years ago. They have not been good on defense this year. So um, their offense is really, I think, the key to this. And uh, they've played you know, pretty well recently. They've shot the ball pretty well uh, against Clemson. They shot the ball really well in the second half against North Carolina. Um, so you know that, that's something that Nate Oates has said, too, where they want to speed it up, uh, get into a running game, get in transition, and try not to get into a half-court sort of game with UConn. Otherwise, I just don't see them having the right pieces to make that happen. Mike, um, this was a team last week that got so hot bombing those threes. Um, but it's like you mentioned, it's not that it's not just that. I mean, they, they've got Klingon in the middle that they have to deal with. Do they have enough size to take him off his game? So there's you know a lot of questions for Alabama. Uh, big questions, uh, no pun intended. Where you know, they, they really did not have uh, good games against big men this year. I mean, they got beat three games in a row in December against Arizona, Purdue, and Creighton, uh, where Zach Eady had his way against them, and, and Brian Kalkbrenner had his way against them for Creighton, and uh, Bio for, uh, for Arizona. You know, it was, it was an issue. Um, Tennessee, I mean, Auburn, which and I broom, they got beat by a lot of different teams this year, and one of the common themes was the big man. And so he went into the North Carolina game thinking, well, Armando Baycott's going to have a field day. And, you know, they doubled him. Uh, he still had, I think, 19 points, but it wasn't overwhelming. And they did a pretty good job against them. Um, and, and so and then Clemson, too. I mean, P.J. Hall was a guy who back in November tore apart Alabama's front court. They beat Alabama back in November. Clemson did. And this past game, they got P.J. Hall to foul out. I think he was 6 of 14 shooting. So... Uh, something's changed, you know, with their front court and the same players, but they're playing harder. They're playing better on defense, and I would give them a little bit of a better shot against Klingon. But Klingon's still probably the best big man that they've seen all year, except for Edie. Do they just have this fearless ability to not even look at the score sometimes and just keep flying it off? It, it, that's what I saw, uh, and, and I love it because whether they're up ten or down ten, they just go and play. Yeah, I mean, that's Nate Oates' philosophy. It's, it's just keep shooting. If, if you're not shooting, if you're passing up open threes, he'll take you out of the game. Uh, he gets mad at that because it's, it all comes down to efficiency. And to him, an open three-pointer is one of the most efficient shots that you can take, just like a layup is one of the most efficient shots that you can take. Um, and so if you're taking a higher percentage shot, then he, he wants you to keep doing that, even if you're not hitting them. So it doesn't mean you're just shooting threes 50 times a game if you're covered because a covered three pointer when you're defended is a much lower percentage shot. But if you're open, he wants you to shoot it no matter what the scoreboard says, no matter what the game situation is like, shoot it. So uh, yeah, that's just as part of his philosophy. And um, you know, it's, it's obviously worked to get his team to where it is now. Mike, how much of it has been a fresh a breath of fresh air because of some of the off the court controversy and stories that they were hit with a year ago and that this team has just gone out and played. Yeah, you know, it's a different team. There's only three players that are left from last year's team. And, yeah, last year's team, you know, was worn down in a couple different ways. Obviously, you know, the Darius Miles, you know, murder charge and, um, you know, everything that was kind of swirling around Brendan Miller and Jaden Bradley. And um, that was a team that just by March kind of seemed out of gas. Um, you know, they weren't shooting the ball very well. They were the number one overall seed in the tournament. But, they got bounced in the Sweet 16, and there were some guys that were kind of banged up, too. Miller was hurt uh, in the tournament last year. But, um, you know, it's the team that underachieved. But it was a, probably a better team, talent-wise, than what this team is. Uh, this team, even though they've been banged up a little bit, too, just kind of seems to have a better vibe, um, especially lately. And uh, they've really kind of had a sense of urgency. And uh, they were just on the road for, I think, 12 nights together. Uh, going from Spokane out to L.A. And 
uh, they have just come together at the right time, uh, kind of off the court. And uh, there's, you know, some moments on the court too, where just random guys have stepped up that we weren't really expecting. And that's what you need to, uh, to go far in a tournament like this. Mike, does this uh, final four run secure Nate Oates that where uh, now he's proven he can do it at Alabama that it would take a pretty large swing from a, a, a blue blood to get him out? He, you know, I know he's kind of a lot of Texas fans on the internet. Uh, he's their kind of maybe Nick Saban of basketball where they always thought Nick Saban's heart laid in Austin, Texas. Do you think Nate Oates uh, could be there really for the long haul now? Yeah, I mean, I think at least for the short term, it's going to be tough for any other school to pull him out of there. He just signed a contract extension that has an $18 million buyout uh, really for the next two years here. And it does start to go down after that. I would imagine they'll probably try to extend him again. You know, they've done it three times already. Um, but there might come a day where, you know, NATO wants to maybe move to a school that is a little bit more of a basketball sort of tradition. I think, you know, Michigan State's kind of the one in everybody's mind because he was a high school coach in Michigan and Tom Izzo's get towards the end of his career. Um, but at the same time, Nate has a daughter who's a student at Alabama. He has another daughter at high school who may go to Alabama herself. And I think he, you know, enjoys being there. I think he sees it as an opportunity to build Alabama into a basketball school. I think he sees it as a place that really loves college sports and has a lot of resources. So, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think he's going to be jumping and he hasn't to this point for just any job that's out there. Now, do I think he's going to be the coach of Alabama in, in 10 or 15 years? You know, I, I would have doubts about that. So Mike, uh, the football team's going through what they go through with, uh, Kalen DeBoer. Uh, you know, this, my God, it was like the, the, the world stopped for there uh, a little bit when the, the Nick Saban story came out, he was retirement retiring. How would you say DeBoer and everyone else now has reacted and where they are, uh, what has it been, like uh, a couple of months later uh, on what could have been just like the ice broke and everybody fell in the water? Yeah, no, it's, it's really stabilized. I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of losses through the portal. I think 30 guys total. A lot of those actually happened before uh, Kalen DeBoer even set foot on campus. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys who had left when, when Saban was still technically the coach. Um, and I think now that, you know, they've gotten Caden Proctor, who was one of the guys who left through the portal, the five-star offensive lineman, he's coming back from Iowa. That was a big win for them. Uh, I think one of the big questions for DeBoer was recruiting the South because he's not from here, doesn't really have any experience here. And they've already picked up a few guys over the last few weeks that have started to, um, you know, prove that they can recruit here. So, you know, there's been little wins here and there, and you know, I, I think we're all going to see the product on the field in another 10 days here when they have their spring game. And I'm sure you know it may not look the most polished because it's a new system and there's a lot of new players. But um, you know, overall, I think yeah, it, it, it could have gone further south uh, than it did certainly. And um, you know, they really they kept things reasonably under control for that that really crazy week. And, um, you know, they've, they've started to build things back up over the last month or two here. So uh, just go ahead and say it now. They don't care about football anymore in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's a basketball school. Well, yeah, I, I was talking to the athletic director, Greg Byrne, <laughs> on the court after uh, they just beat Clemson. I said, you guys still have a football team? <laughs> he was like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's different. But, uh, yeah, I, Honestly, most of the reporters this week are going to be out in Phoenix at the uh, the Final Four. There's yep. three different press conferences for football, and I don't know how many people are going to be there to talk to Kalen DeBoer. Never would have thought that. Where were you when the news of Saban hit? Uh, <laughs> I was actually at the gym. I uh, I had kind of heard about it, you know, that it, it might happen, and I was a little bit in disbelief or just not wanting to believe it. And I said, oh, man, I really want to get a workout in today. So I get to the gym and then 4.04, I think I checked my phone yep. and sure enough, it happened. And needless to say, I was in scramble mode from there. Uh, has Nick Saban been to Rama Jamas yet? Now that he knows <laughs> it exists. Right. Yeah. I, I don't think he has, but you no know, people, <laughs> that was an ESPN article that yep. said, you know, yeah, he didn't know it was there. He didn't know what it was. And this is like an iconic place in Tuscaloosa. People said, oh, he's just kidding. He's joking. He is not. Believe me. Nick Saban lived in his own bubble. Like, he absolutely did not know that was 
a thing in Tuscaloosa. So he's starting to open up a little bit. He's starting to kind of see the world. Um, he's just kind of the quintessential uh, tunnel vision sort of guy when he was a coach for a very, very long time, and it, it worked out really well. Mike, you know what I can't believe? I can't believe he wasn't there for like a photo shoot or just, I mean, any kind of thing ever in 17 years on that. Like, it's not like it's far from the Isn't stadium. Isn't it like a like, block or two away? No, it's it's like, it's almost, yeah. it, it feels like it's connected to it. It's the first place I went when I went to Tuscaloosa. Like, that was... I went there. We waited a long time for a table and sat down so I could say we we got the full experience. Like just to never to have like a you know, him and the mascot and three players and like, mm. you know, or or some kind of thing for a magazine, a newspaper, a website, nothing blows my mind. I, he he moved around though, like he was the president of the United States. I mean, there's yeah. security detail, the two state troopers, the Mercedes, you know, SUVs in front of him. Like it was a, a, a convoy. And he was always very, just so regimented and, all right, if I'm doing this, I have this person handling this for me and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, they're opening the door and it's just, you live that life for, I mean, 17 years in Alabama and just never really ventured outside of that. I think even that ESPN article said he went to the, you know, the pharmacy for the first time to pick up his own prescription and he went to the grocery store. Like he never did those things. Absolutely believe that. Like all that was done for him. Um, so, yeah, it just – that's who he was. He just went into the facility every day, went to his office, and uh, tried not to be out in, in the public eye too much. Well, I, I remember either the, the evening of the, the, the announcement when it came out or the next day when he arrived at the Alabama uh, offices that he got out of his car, it looked like a really nice – like a Beamer or whatever it was, a Lexus, whatever it might be, and he had somebody come walking around to take his car probably and park it, had somebody there waiting for him at the door. Uh, and, and, I mean, he's that powerful, but I never felt like he let that get in his head. Like, he preaches what it's like about team and individuals working together, and I never felt like he ever really went down the, the wrong rabbit hole. Uh, the story about the pharmacy and the grocery store is hilarious i mean it's it's like he's like moved into a different country <laughs> could you imagine just w- being the pharmacist and, and he like walks in is like uh nick saban for my lipitor and they're like <laughs> what <laughs> that was really good <laughs> does he even need to say his name i mean what's your date of birth let me confirm that you're who you are <laughs> mike what were the initial thoughts and again thanks for your time on both the men in the final four and also alabama football what were your thoughts on the DeBoer when he was hired uh, was there any thought at all that Jalen Milrow, the fit, even though he had a really great ending to the year, although the, the last call against Notre Dame didn't go well, was there any thought that, that he might not stay at Alabama? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, for a lot of the players, kind of that process of what are my options. And I would imagine for Jalen Milrow, given some of his success last year, like, you know, were there other schools probably calling him with yeah, pretty name big you, offers? Name like, price, right? Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't doubt that for a second, but you know, Jalen, I think is a very loyal guy to Alabama. He, he's kind of his own regimented guy himself. I mean, he's in the facility at 4am every day. Like he's very, very focused himself. Um, and it just didn't seem like he wanted to stray from where he had been, that path that he was on. So um, look, I, I think, For now, Kalen DeBoer is certainly all in on Jalen Miller. He's had a lot of great things to say about him this spring. Um, Is he the best right fit for this offense under Jalen or under Kalen DeBoer? I think we'll just have to see. Like, I think they're going to run with it. I think DeBoer is trying to be flexible. I don't think, you know, it's a precision passing offense. I don't think that's necessarily Jalen's strength. He's more of a home run hitter uh, in terms of the running and, and his arm, but. We'll see. Like, I, I, they can make it work. You know, that, that's the marriage. I think they're going to try to make work here. Well, one thing I was told, Kim, on our chat room, Mike, was that, that again, Saban owns a Mercedes dealership. We know that. That's what he was driving, not a not something else. That's what he was most likely driving. Mike, great stuff. Man, I watch your timeline. You do a great job covering Bama. Thanks for your time, and hope we get you on again down the road. Have a great day. Sounds great. Thank you, guys. Mike Rodak, 247, covers Alabama with us on 